Good morning, everybody, and happy Wednesday. Uh, we are very, very excited about this morning's master series. We have a very special guest for you. Um, before we get started, I am going to go through a few housekeeping items as I normally do. My name is Marissa Arnold. I am your chair of the ARIA YPN committee, and I'm very happy to be here this morning. Uh, we uh, are going to answer as many questions of yours as you can. So please, if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or pop them in the Q&A, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. The other exciting event that we have coming up is next Wednesday at 10 a.m., we will be airing the YPN Leadership Award. So we encourage you to tune in. We're going to celebrate three amazing realtors who are, have, are doing so much for their community and their realtor community. So next Wednesday at 10 a.m., please feel free to tune in. I am going to turn it over now to my wonderful co-chair, Matt Richling, who is going to introduce our special guest. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I'm going to take the easy way out here. Tommy, welcome. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Give us, give us the quick uh, rundown and, and go through it. Yes. Honestly, thank you uh, for not reading my boring bio. That makes me feel cooler than I really am, uh, but not even really. Uh, but thank you both for having me and kudos to you and grateful for your leadership and what you're doing to continue to carry and pass along the YPN torch um, where you all are at. Uh, so my name's Tommy Choi. I am from a small city in America called Chicago in Illinois, uh, born and raised uh, there all my life. I'm second generation. My family immigrated uh, to the city of Chicago in the 70s from South Korea. I uh, wear a couple hats when it comes to real estate. I've been licensed and a realtor for 16 years. I own um, a Keller Williams brokerage here in Chicago, and I also uh, am still in production and have a top producing um, you know, mega team, so to say. We're the number six team out of 19,000 realtors here in Chicago. Um, I'm still, like I said, in production too. That's my like first love. I love that feeling and the high I get when I le leave a listing appointment and earn the trust of our clients. Um, so still focus on the listing side, run a team of about 20 uh, realtors. Um, we Last year, our production was uh, about $110 million uh, in sales volume. That equates to just around 175 units for us. And uh, just really looking forward to being here. I'm a YPN OG, uh, was a part of the first board when it launched in Chicago, was the chair of the Chicago YPN board back in the day. Um, and uh, got the opportunity in 2019 to chair the National YPN Advisory Board for the National Association of Realtors, too. So I feel right at home with all of you YPNers. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, you've got a pretty stacked resume, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say this morning. Uh, what are you here to chat with us about today? Can you can you fill us in? I'm 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 here to to pour into all of you, talk about whatever you want to talk about. Feel free to ask anything. Uh, I'm an open book. Matt knows me. I'm very transparent. Um, you know, I, I haven't figured out everything uh, in life or in business, but what I have figured out, I'm willing to always share. And hopefully people watching will walk away with at least one thing to inspire them and, and make them better in their business and personal life. Awesome. Awesome. So why don't we kick it off then with uh, our first question, and we're going to make it uh, about relationship building. So can you talk to us about um, how you go about building relationships with your clients and maybe how that's changed over the years? That's such a great question and something that I obsess over because our business for our team in the last 16 years, year over year, will always fluctuate anywhere between 89 and 91% referral base. So relationship building is something that is our number one lead generation source. Uh, we don't pay for online leads and whatnot, not because you know it doesn't work, but that's not what makes us happy, right? Pouring into our data bank and establishing, cultivating, curating those relationships is, is what really fuels us. I'll tell you, um, relationship, 101 for me, what really helped me understand. Um, it, it, it goes back to uh, this idea, right? 
people have this apprehension in our industry or in any sales job, right? To pick up the phone and, you know, call and ask for a referral or ask for that introduction and whatnot. And, you know, a lot of people will kind of get bullied into it, right? They'll be like, well, you know, get over yourself, right? You're in sales, right? And try and sweep under, you know, or the rug, the way you're feeling. And I think that it's a really poor way to go about it because that feeling of apprehension you have, I once had that as well and hesitation to call. It's not because I'm scared to make this call, right? It's because really at the end of the day, if I reverse engineer my feelings, it's why should I ask this person for something when I've not done something for that person? And that feeling you really have to take time to honor and reflect on because it's a real feeling. And when you do that, it really helps you break down what you need to do. And for me, that aha really came down to having that feeling one day and going to the bank and pulling up to an ATM machine, right? And for the millennials that are watching, an ATM is like a brick and mortar Venmo or Cash App. Um, we used to actually go to a physical place to slide a card into a machine, um, but it's it's no different, right? Than your Venmo app. At the end of the day, whether it's you know your Venmo, Cash App, Zelle, or going to an ATM old school like me, when you pull up, there's really only two action items, right? You either can make a deposit, put money into your account, or you make a withdrawal and take money out. That was the light bulb that clicked in my head. And that ultimately is the foundation of relationship building. When you meet someone for the first time, just like right walking up to that ATM, I know I have two options. I can take from that relationship and make a withdrawal and ask for something, or I can make a deposit into that person's life, right? I can make um, and add value to them. And for us, our secret sauce has been leading with deposits, right? We like to make three deposits before we make a withdrawal. Now, a deposit, it's not literally like we're bribing someone, we're showering them with gifts. Deposits are made by listening, right? Having conversations with people and understanding what their pain points are, what problems they have. Because what we learned is when you solve other people's problems, they will solve your problems. It's very simple, right? So for us, when we lead generate, we're always asking, obviously we're always asking for business referrals, but we like to really ask for uh, introductions, right? And I'll even share kind of the script that we use. Like if I'm calling Matt and he's one of my past clients, I'm like, Matt, you know, asking from for a referral, you know, we have a really big goal this year and, you know, we really need help from our supporters like you that we have so much gratefulness to. Who do you know that's looking to buy, sell, invest in real estate, right? And Matt, you know, he might be like, oh man, TC, you're my guy. Honestly, I, I don't know. But when I do think of someone, obviously I'm going to make that connection, right? We acknowledge that. I'm like, Matt, I know that. And I'm super grateful for you for that and your continued support. I know I just put you on the spot. And when I get put on the spot, it's like a deer in headlights. And I don't really know. My brain goes to mush. Let me ask you another question, though. Who's someone in your world that you highly respect, that you just like have fun with, that you love being around that I haven't met yet? Can I make, can you make an introduction to those people? Now, what'll happen is they'll go silent on the other line. And Matt, it's because I just put him on the spot again and he's deer in the headlights again, right? So I'll nudge him a little bit with the help and I'll acknowledge him like, Matt, I just did it again. I know I just put you on the spot. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a clue, right? As to what I'm alluding to. When you're at work and you're about to go grab lunch, who's a person that's in your Slack channel that you're saying like, hey, I'll be ready in 15 minutes and you go out to have lunch together. Or if there's like a happy hour at work, Who's that person you're texting and messaging like, hey, let's go to this thing together, right? Now, all of a sudden, Matt's like, oh, that's Marissa, right? Of course, yeah. I don't, I, I can't believe you guys haven't met. She's so awesome. You know, she just bought her a brokerage. She's like an entrepreneur. She's killing it. You're killing it. Yeah, I'd love to connect you, right? Those are the introductions we look for, right? Because at the end of the day, when we get those introductions and now I Facebook stalk you, and I type in first name, last name, enter, and I see that we have only one connection and it's Matt, 
I'm salivating to get in front of you because I know that as long as you're not a jerk and you're someone that I want to establish a relationship with, the possibilities are endless, right? Into you allowing me into your network and allowing me to make those withdrawals, right? So when those one-on-ones happen, for us, that's what I consider an appointment, right? A lot of times people think appointments just like a buyer consultation listing appointment, right? For me, meeting someone new, that's an appointment. Now, what do you do when you meet with these people, right? When I pull up to coffee, typically coffee is uh, my go-to, right? Because one, it's non-committal. If Marissa is there waiting for me, I end up being a psychopath. She's going to just get up and leave, right? And then she walks out with a cup of coffee too. So it's kind of not like a full loss, right? It's like a net zero. So people are willing to say yes to that setting, right? Because they're not trapped to be meeting with you. So I always like to lead with coffee when I'm first meeting someone. When I get to those meetings, those those face-to-faces as we call them, right? I follow something that's a lot of people follow. It's called the Ford model, F-O-R-D, right? And it stands for family, occupation, recreation, dreams. That's just my framework on the conversation. I can obviously hold a conversation myself, but when you go in with a framework and a plan, it keeps things going, right? So you're not caught in the deer and headlights moment. And there's this awkward silence in this new interaction you're having with this new potential person, right? So I always ask that, you know, hey, you know, do, are you married, Marissa? Do you have spouse on a significant other? Do you have pets, children, right? I'm asking things about, you know, her potential family occupation. Hey, tell me a little bit about, you know, what you do. How long have you been doing it? Are you happy? Do you like what you do? Right? Recreation. What do you like to do on the weekends? What do you do to have fun? Right? Dreams. I always pick from one of those three things, family, occupation, recreation that we just talked about. And I'm going to cast like a dream question, right? Let's say Marissa says, Hey, I like to play, you know, pickleball. I'm like, Hey, like Marissa, what is like, What's your dream scenario in pickleball? Do you want to like continue to play or trying to get professional? Are you wanting to get into tournaments? You know, tell me about that, right? During these conversations, being an active listener, right? I literally pull out a notebook and I start taking notes, right? Because all the answers to the questions that you're asking this person, those answers are basically deposit slips they're giving you right? They're telling you things and clues. And these are sometimes problems that they may have that you can offer solutions to, right? I'm going to give you an example. So there's a gentleman named Mark K who is a uh, uh, someone in my network, right? Not even a client. I got introduced to him probably in 2016, let's just say. And same thing. It was an introduction from another past client of mine, coworker, had coffee, going through the Ford model, asking questions. Recreationally, he loves going on hikes. And I asked him, hey, what's like, what's your dream hike? What's what's like the place, one place you really want to go to that you haven't been? And he said, it's actually not just one place, it's multiple places. And it's a trip. I'm like, tell me about it. It's like, I want to rent an RV and go to every national park west of the Mississippi in the United States and stop and go on hikes at all the major points. And I was like, holy crap, this is incredible, right? This guy is just has a vision on what he wants. He was an awesome person. He wasn't a jerk, right? I knew I wanted to build a relationship with him. So afterwards, I always follow up. And what I did was, right, I'm like, I got to make a deposit into this guy's life. So I went on Amazon and I bought for like $2, right, a little Matchbox toy RV. And I shipped it to him, right, with a handwritten note. The shipping cost more than, you know, the, the actual cost of this little toy car. And I just said, hey, how grateful I am at the opportunity to have met. I was really inspired by the conversation. And here's a little token of my appreciation just to visualize your dream hiking trip one day. Mark, fast forward 2020, when no one was really flying in the in the United States and everyone was renting RVs to go on vacations with their family, 
He rented his R- an RV, went to every national park. He brought that toy matchbox car with him and he took a selfie at every national park sign and he sent it to me. And he said, hey, I did it, man. I'm going on this trip. Thank you for sending me this motivation. I looked at it every day. Now, that small deposit I made throughout the years, Mark, he had already bought a really nice home when I had met him, right? And this is his forever home. He's probably not going to sell this thing until his kids, you know, move out. However, I've never gotten to work with him. That's why I don't call him a client, right? Since that time, he has referred 15 people that have bought on an average of two and a half million dollar homes, okay? All from the small deposit that I made, right? Because I cared, I listened. And I showed him that I was listening and I was rooting for him, right? That's the whole with, withdrawal deposits. This guy now, right? I've earned the right to make withdrawals from our relationship. In fact, I don't even have to ask. He's giving me basically his ATM card and pin saying like, whenever you need anything, just hit me up, right? So when our team is behind goal for the month, we go into something called the 15th protocol after the 15th of the month. And now I'm calling these people who I have the withdrawal, the right to make withdrawals from. And I can call Mark. Of course, I like want to catch up and go through the pleasantries. But if I need it to and just say like, Mark, hey, I'll make this quick. I need help. We're behind in our goal. I need introductions. I need referrals. Can you help me out, brother? Right? And he takes zero offense to it. And he's willing to help because he wants to, right? Because the deposits that I continually make into his life. So to answer, you know, that question, you know, even longer, as long as you're breaking down, right? Making, finding ways to make those deposits, you're building up your relationship capital, right? That's how we've built this referral, referral based business throughout the years. And right. Our clients, because of the deposits we continually make and the value we continually bring, they think we're cool. They don't want to like lose this relationship. So they constantly are feeding us with referral opportunities so that we can continually shower them with deposits. So so COVID hits and you know, you can't meet in person and coffee now. And you know, tell us a little bit about how you kind of pivoted, maybe for that, and then tell us now, maybe what's evolved since then. So I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, you, how you approach that has kind of evolved. So what do you do differently in yeah. 2023? Great question. So what's really evolved? Some of the deposits that we make, right, are uh, through events. We're very events driven, and so we typically do one major event every quarter. So four major events a year. And then we also empower our buyers specialist teams to have micro events every month, right? So that was a huge shift that we had to make and we had to adapt. Uh, I'll give you an example, right? One that we just happened that's changed and we've kept it now. It's one call we call Operation Love, okay? And that is around, of course, Valentine's Day, right? And so typically in the past, pre-COVID, what we used to do was at the end of the year, right? Last week of December, first week of January, we make what we call our gratitude calls. By the way, we only call our people two times a year. Okay. So anyone that's got like anxiety of like making phone calls, it's like super simple. You don't have to be like dialing people nonstop. But our second call of the year, the end of the year calls, what we call a gratitude call. And it's very simple, right? It's me just saying, hey, Marissa, it's Tommy Choi from the Weinberg Choi residential team. You know, this time of year, I'm always thinking, reflecting back and thinking about who and what I'm grateful for. And I just want to let you know, you are one of those people that are on that list. Thank you so much for all your support this past year, throughout the years, referrals, your business introductions. We couldn't do what we do without people like you. No need to call me back. I just want to let you know that I'm thinking about you and I'm super grateful, right? That's it. That's a, that's that's an easy phone call to make. That's like a really it's, easy phone call. And it's like one, like nine out of 10 calls, people like, you know, you send to voicemail. Uh, and then after you leave that voicemail, within a second, people text you right away, right? And say like, oh my gosh, like I'm ugly face crying. Like no one's ever expressed their gratitude. But when they pick up, it's even like they're at a loss for words. Because how often do we, that just shows you as a society, how often are we taking time to praise people, right? And express our gratitude. So with that call, right? Our first call of the month, the follow-up call to that, while it's fresh, right? And, and, you know, typically, right, we're calling, 
you know, especially um, of our database that we know uh, have are in a relationship or are married, spouse, whatever, we're calling one of the, the people and, and letting them know at that time, like, hey, by the way, you know, it's, uh, and a lot of times they're calling back from, you know, our voicemail, right? So it's like, hey, by the way, I just want to let you know, you know, in about 45 days, it's Valentine's Day. I know, Matt, you're just Rico Suave, super smooth with the ladies. So I know you've got it all planned out, but if you need an assist, right, and you need that help and plug, please let me know. We have reservations from 6.30 to 8.30 every 15 minutes at our five favorite restaurants. And you know me, right? I only eat at dope spots, so I got you, right? And typically, Matt is like, TC, thank you so much, man. You're always you know, thinking of us. You're always one step ahead, but you're right. I am smooth. And I got this, right? That's a month and a half away. Don't worry about it. Cool. On, on that note, if anyone's ever in Chicago, reach out to Tommy and he'll give you the best recommendations. Seriously, cold, cold I'll, message him and just be like, where do I eat? You know what? After this, remind me and I'll, and I'll, I'll give, a, 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 as DJ Khaled says, a major key. And I'll tell you how I build relationships with restaurateurs to use to make deposits to our database. So that conversation ends, right? Now we follow up at the end of January, sometimes with just a text message. And it's just like, hey, Matt, I know we already talked about this and you're all good to go for Valentine's Day, but I'm just letting you know, you know, we're about 14 days away. If you need help, RPM, Maple and Ash, whatever you need, I got you, right? And usually Matt's texting back, dude, thank you so much. But yes, I got you. I got it. So all good. Then usually the week of Valentine's Day, Matt's calling me frantically like, hey, man, I totally messed up. I didn't realize, but every restaurant is like booked for Valentine's Day. Do you still have any openings? Right. I'm like, of course, I got you. Right. 730 RPM Italian. Right. And usually Matt's like, dude, very funny. Like, what, what can you get me into? I'm like 730 RPM Italian. It's like, how is that possible? That place is like completely booked. I got you. Right. So what I do, though, in that situation we keep the reservation in my name, right? Because when Matt pulls up to the restaurant and goes to the maitre d' stand, I want him to physically remember and say my name because Tommy Choi is the reason why I am taking this girl out, my wife, whatever, to uh, to dinner tonight. And now if it's someone who has sent us more than two referrals, we will also go ahead and pay for their first round of drinks. Usually we tell them bring out, you know, Prosecco or champagne, right? Something that costs us $25 at most uh, to do. So that was a huge, huge deposit for us that we used to do. 2020 hit, restaurants are shut down, no indoor dining. We're like, shoot, what are we going to do in 2021 for that, right? So what we decided to do is pivot. We want to still support our local restaurants, but people were now more apt to in-home dining experiences. So we pivoted that and made Operation Love, calling one of our uh, restaurants that we would uh, send people to and that we we always love, Stella Barra. Uh, now it's Summer House, they combine, but they have um, Neapolitan South Pizzas. So we asked them, hey, we want to support you all, right? Because we're, we're community leaders here and, and the customers that come and dine in your restaurant we are helping them find housing in the neighborhood, right? So we're on the same page. We want to support you as a local restaurant in the neighborhood. Is there any way we could do some sort of at-home pizza kit where you just pack the dough, the sauce, the cheese, instructions, we'll pay for it. And we can just, you can box it up however you want to packaging wise. And we want to give this to our clients, right? As Operation Love. That honestly was I thought, I'm like, okay, we're going to do this for one year. We're going to go back to, you know, old Operation Love. It was a huge hit because people love the idea. I guess people don't want to go out on Valentine's Day anymore, right? And pay for the inflated prices and whatnot. So they love that we were allowing them to enjoy their meal at the home that we helped them purchase, right? So that's little things like that's how we adapted and now we continue to stay because the reach is better. We have them come to us to pick up the pizzas at our office. So we get to see a face-to-face, -face, make that deposit in person. 
they express their gratitude for us, right? And every time like clockwork, right? We're always getting referrals from that. The key though, I will say, in any event, any deposit you make, if you don't take the time to follow up after that deposit, after that event, everything you had done is basically a waste of time, money, and resources because that follow-up phone call is where the magic happens. And that follow-up phone call is typically one that they are willing and wanting to pick up. As soon as they see Tommy pull up on the screen, Matt is trying to answer that on one ring, right? Because he is so grateful that he got to go out to Valentine's Day and I got him into RPM Italian or I gave him a pizza to make an at-home pizza uh, date night at home. And he just wants to shower me with love and let me know how appreciative and grateful I am, right? And that's a perfect segue for me now to be like, hey, dude, I got you. You know how grateful I am for you, Matt. It's been such a long time since we caught up. Can we grab coffee next week? I'd love to just catch up. He's not going to say no. He has to be a complete asshole to say no to me, right? I just bought him a pizza, right? I got him into the hot restaurant for Valentine's Day. And then I can follow the Ford model, figure out more ways to make deposits, ask for referrals, make a withdrawal, right? So it's parlaying everything into this opportunity where you continue to remind them of this trust that you've built, right? And this influencer that you are for them and working that into more opportunities for yourself. And you know, the best thing about old Operation Love was, you know, our operations team, they didn't even have to talk to anyone to make reservations because there's this thing called open table, right? And everything's online. So everything was super easy to do. It's, and it doesn't cost you anything. It's just the thoughtfulness and making those deposits for your network. So a ton of what you said is uh, exactly what uh, we talk to our agents about. It's so, so important to come at everything that you do from a place of gratitude because we are firm believers here and, and it's true, you get by giving. And the other thing that I always say to my agents, I'm like, they call me a walking billboard. It's kind of funny, but... <laughs> be their agent before you're their agent. And so that is very much in line with what you've said of provide people value, provide people um, a, a, a takeaway, get, make deposits in, in into their lives. And if you can do that, then they will reciprocate. Come at it from a place of gratitude and, and give them some items of value. You're winning every single time. You nailed it. I always say gratitude is recession proof. I don't care how high interest rates go. I don't care how much inventory there is or there isn't. If Wall Street's crashing, when you look at everything through a lens of gratitude, nothing can affect you, right? Being grateful for things that go right, being grateful for things that go wrong, right? Be able to learn from those experiences. As long as you're looking at things through that lens of gratitude, everything will always work out. So let this is a perfect segue into our next question. Um, since you come at your business and your life, it seems from a place of gratitude, has it been difficult to cultivate that gratitude mindset? And how do you do that? Especially when things are just going wrong, how do you how do you keep in that gratitude mindset? I love that question. And you know, gratitude is like a muscle, okay? And, and believe me, I know nothing about muscles. I don't work out. I, I'm more about eating than losing weight. But gratitude is a muscle that if you don't exercise that gratitude muscle daily, it's hard for it to kick in when you really need it, right? It's going to get flabby and it's not going to be in shape and the gratitude strength isn't going to be there. So it's something that you have to work on daily, okay? And so for us, what that looks like with our team, especially, is that every morning at 8.30, we have a huddle, right? And now it's virtual. It makes it easier for everyone to just kind of jump on. And it's short. It's 15, maybe 20 minutes long. And there's uh, four pillars that we discuss in that. But the first one, everyone has to go around. Everyone gets to go around and share what they're grateful for, right? And the building up your gratitude muscle, you know, it, it goes from, right, especially when I see new people on our team, it's like, you know, one, it, it's changing this idea of being thankful for something to being grateful for something, right? Thankful for something, right, is expected, right? If, Marissa, you bought me dinner, right, 
and I sent you a thank you card for dinner, you would be like, yeah, no shit. I bought him dinner. He should be thanking me, right? You're appreciated, but it's not expected, right? Gratitude is finding that piece in a scenario and a thing you're in to be grateful for, right? It's not something that's automatically uh, a reaction to an action that happened. So that's one is important, right? And working on that daily helps you get your mind from being like, oh, I'm thankful for this to I'm grateful for this. The other thing is when your gratitude strength is built up, right? You can find the little things to be grateful for. When you When I have new team members on our team that go around, you know, the first couple of weeks, it's always like, I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my parents. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my spouse. You're grateful for the big things, which is like, once again, yes, of course you're grateful for those things, right? When you can find the gratitude in the little things, like being grateful for Starbucks mobile order, because I didn't have to wait in line, grateful for Netflix, because I was able to binge watch for three hours, you know, um, you know, uh, this show, grateful for the little things. That's how you continually build up that strength. And when stuff hits the fan in a deal, right? Two weeks ago, I got fired from a $3 million listing. Okay. And sure it sucked. Right. And I'm like, Oh, this sucks. But then having my gratitude muscle and the strength built up, my gratitude kicked in right away. Like, you know what? I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Not ma many people can say that, they were fired, right? Or even hired for an opportunity like this in, in our market. I'm super grateful for that chance. And I'm grateful that I learned. I know what I did wrong to have lost this client. And now I can grow from that and hopefully avoid that in the future, right? That's, that's the importance. You have to work on that daily. And you can't just like in your mind say, I'm grateful for that. You have to put it out to the world because- the way this universe works, right? And there's no data or science and so no one try and fact check me on this. This is just from me living my life for the past 41 years. The more gratitude you express into the universe, you are. I've learned that you're telling the universe that you are ready to be showered with more opportunity and gifts, right? And it's gonna come back to you. And it's true, right? So the more that you can practice that, the more that you can build that gratitude muscle up, the more, that's why I say it's recession proof, the more you'll be able to get through what you need to get through. So that's super important, right? I do, I do the gratitude journals in the morning too, right? I'm doing like two a days, right? When it comes to my gratitude workouts, um, because it's just that important. The other piece, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a secret sauce, but something I've always done in my calendar, right? On my time block at night at 1030, I always, I have a little, you know, five minute reminder that comes out that calls it's called cash out, right? It's like, you know, when anyone that's worked retail, when you close, you know, the store down, the first thing you do is cash out your register, right? So it's really important, I think, when you wind your day down to have before you go to bed, before you're completely in like relaxed mode and unplugged mode to cash out your day. And so that's my reminder to cash out. And I reflect back on what was that one win for today that made me feel really good? And what am I grateful for again from today, right? It's a great way to just end your night. Then after that, don't look at any texts from clients, emails, whatever. You're completely cashed out, you're registered, and you're ready to start your next day, the following day, right? So those are my practices for having gratitude on the forefront in our dashboard at all times. So you go to bed like really late. Uh... 10 30 is like so late. <laughs> my sister in law, yep. pardon? I, I, I thought 10 30 was early. Oh, I mean, no? I, what time do you go to bed? I, uh, 8 30. No way. Yeah, but I'm up at five every day though. I'm, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. <laughs> you know, I have, I have one of those aura rings. And it's like, I always wonder why I bought this because it tells me the same thing that I already know that I'm not ready for the day yet, you know? <laughs> so it's like, you didn't get enough sleep. Oh yeah, I know that. Well, men need more, men need less sleep than women. So we'll, we'll leave it there. That's um, true. So my sister-in-law is on this call right now. She's an agent in our office and she knows, and she thinks it's hilarious. Every single night at the dinner table, we go around the table and I don't care who's at my house. I don't care if it's 30 people what's one thing that made you happy today? And yes. everybody's kind of looking at us going, 
Well, why? Because, because look at our lives and look at everything we've accomplished. And we've done that out of a place of gratitude. I think it's, I think it, it is the pillar, the, the most important thing that you can do every single day. Um, okay, Matt, do you have anything to add before we get to our next question? No, no. Uh, I, I was gonna, I was gonna kind of go down to the path of volunteering, and you, you know, you're, you're, I'd say heavily involved in volunteering within organized real estate, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, kind of what, what got you started in that journey, and then can you tell us about, you know, what you get out of it, and just kind of go down some of that. Yeah, that's a great question, and it, and it's one that I've been asked a lot, uh, and I, and simply put. It comes from a place of gratitude, right? I'm so grateful for what this industry has provided for myself, the opportunities and resources it's provided my family. Uh, you know, I have three daughters, right? 10, five, or 10, eight, and five. So, you know, they cost a lot of money. So I, I really am grateful for the resources that this uh, business has provided me. So with that, I feel that I have a responsibility to protect this opportunity, not just selfishly for myself to continue on with my career, but for other people, right? I was 25 years old uh, when I when I got licensed and I uh, jumped into this industry. Um, I'm sorry, 20, yeah, 25, 26. And for me, I want to make sure that door that I just walked through 16 plus years ago, I always want to keep my foot wedged in between so it never shuts so that that 25 year old today who's at that corporate crossroads and miserable like I was can find joy and happiness in this industry and see that success. So for me, part of that's just not sitting back and hoping, you know, nothing happens. It's me being on the front line and being as involved as I can. And so for me, one, like I said, the YPN, that was a huge tipping point in my career. I can confidently tell you, you know, had I not been in the white, had I not been a part of the YPN, I would probably still have accomplished what I have done today, but probably 10 years from now, right? It really accelerated my growth and my success. And that's because I was around like-minded people, right? Iron sharpens iron as one person sharpens another. And these people, right? Uh, especially when I was first new to the industry, when I didn't have it was just me and my business partner. I didn't have anyone around me. So all the struggles and challenges that I face, I just felt they were proprietary to me, right? There was a point where I was like, man, maybe I'm not cut out to be a realtor. Maybe I need to go back to making 130 cold calls a day, selling IT equipment to state and local government IT directors, right? That was miserable. That was like going to uh, the DMV 130 times a day, right? It, it was terrible. So for me, being back involved, right? Uh, getting involved and continue to stay involved uh, was important to protect that. Now, my leadership journey continuing on, right? I was the president of the Chicago Association of Realtors. Um, that I'm the current treasurer for the Illinois Realtors, which is you know our state. And then I was a vice president of the National Association of Realtors in 2021. All that was. Uh, that gratitude, it transforms a little bit from, you know, day one protecting, right, the opportunity that I was able to uh, thrive in, to now being a lighthouse, um, to know, show that other people that this opportunity exists, right, whether it's other Asian realtors, I was the first Korean American president in 135 years. I was the first Korean American Asian vice president for NAR, right? I'll be the first Asian uh, leadership team member in our state, making sure not just other Asian realtors across the country, but just people of color um, can see that, hey, you know, we belong here and there's an opportunity in leadership for you as well, right? It's not about being the first and breaking through the door, it's making sure that I'm not the only, and there's a second, third, fourth, fifth, and more behind, right? And then the other part of it is being a beacon and lighthouse for other realtors that are highly in production like I am. Because at the time, there are a lot of haters during my come up that were like, I don't get it, dude. Why are you so involved with the association and YPN? Why don't you just focus more of your energy on selling, right? I'm the, wrong, I'm the wrong person to say that kind of stuff to, right? Because I'm highly competitive, not against people, 
but you give me that kind of size log to put on my fire, I'm going to make sure this fire burns, right? And so for me, it was another log on my fire to push myself to not just become one of the top 10 realtors in the city of Chicago, but also give back at the highest level that I can to be that beacon of hope to other realtors in production that, hey, you don't give for giving back, right? You actually, the more you give back, the more your business will grow. And I have evidence of success for that, right? Being involved on a national level. Last year, uh, our team closed 45 referral deals, right? That came from other realtors that we all serve and volunteer with outside of Chicago and outside of Illinois because they, right, know this person's like me. I want my clients that want to buy in Chicago or sell in Chicago to be serviced by someone who understands and gives back. That's the that's the the relationship, right, of giving back at a high level, um, you know, can do for your business and for your personal growth. So it all it all stems from that place of gratitude, you know, making sure that um, what we have continues to stay for other people's. So a lot of what you just said segues into two awesome questions that we got in the Q&A. Um, you chatted a little bit about your morning huddle and mm -hmm. uh, asking uh, your team to give you one thing that they're grateful for. Uh, Trudy is wondering uh, what the other three pillars are in your huddle. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for asking, Trudy. Um, so first thing is we start with gratitude. Everyone goes around and expresses what they're grateful for. The second piece, right? You know, I have a larger team. So our operation team, we call it housekeeping. They share housekeeping items. And what housekeeping items mean is these are the experts and the people that we trust and we hired to create systems for us because we, we're, I'm not a systems oriented person, right? So they have to hold us accountable to the systems that they create to make sure we're following that. So second pillar is housekeeping where our operation teams put any housekeeping pieces out there. The third piece is for our sales team now. Uh, we call it choke points, right? This is any part of a deal that one of our salespeople, maybe it's in a negotiation, maybe it's in an interaction with a client that they feel stuck, right? That they're choking for air and they need some other perspective and other people on the team to breathe some more air into them so that they can look at the scenario from a different set of angles. So our third piece is those choke points where salespeople go around and share their choke points. Our fourth piece, this is the most important, right? It comes down to full accountability, right? For us, accountability, when we call this, is putting the fish on the table, okay? And it's super weird, right? But think about anyone that, you know, has ever ordered fish at a restaurant, right? Let's say a nice piece of salmon. When, when it comes out of that kitchen and the server puts down that plate. It's a perfectly filleted and cooked piece of fish. It's on top of all the little, you know, accoutrements on the plate, right? The microgreens that nobody eats, but they just always put them on there. That beautifully plated dish that also tastes delicious, right? When done right, that's not how it came out of the ocean, the lake, the water, right? Someone had to put a catch the fish, put it on the table, they had to gut the thing. They had to clean the thing. They had to chop up the thing, descale, debone. It gets kind of gross and nasty and smelly, but you go through this process to get to this beautiful end result, right? So for us, our accountability is called putting the fish on the table. So that's our time for our team to hold each other accountable, right? And where when you put the fish on the table, you come from a place of love and understanding versus pointing the finger and blaming, right? It goes from saying, Matt, last you know, yesterday, we're all supposed to, you know, agree to eat lunch at our table, right? And make extra calls because we're behind our goal for the month. And dude, I saw you sneak out. And then you came back and I noticed you had like this like ketchup stain on your shirt. Bro, you probably went out to eat when we we're all eating, you know, uh, Subway sandwiches at our desk, you know, putting in this extra effort. That pissed me off, man. Now, Matt's going to get defensive, right? Because he just got called out and he, and and I'm pointing my finger at him. He's not going to explain anything. He's not going to want to do anything. It's just going to cause more friction, right? But when you put that fish on the table and our team, that conversation looks like this, like, hey, Matt, I just got to put the fish on the table. You know, yesterday we all agreed. We're all going to stick around for lunch, make those extra calls, really push our 
get closer to our goal because we're behind, you know, and I, and I had just noticed you weren't there. Right. Um, I just want you to know, right. That kind of hurt me because I thought we were all on the same page, rowing the boat in the same direction at the same time to really accomplish this goal together as a team. Right now, Matt, right? Comes from a place of understanding, like, man, okay, like TC, I'm sorry to disappoint you or hurt you. I should have been more transparent. You know, I had to go meet um, our washer and dryers broken. I had to go meet a service person. That's the only time I could do it because my wife was with the kids and yada, yada, yada. I don't know if you noticed, but that's why I had this like ketchup stain on my shirt. I haven't been able to do laundry in weeks, but I should have been more transparent, right? Now, I have, I come, I get to understand where Matt's coming from, right? And this narrative that I painted in my head before putting the fish on the table that he just doesn't care, right? It's like, oh shit, I'm sorry that happened, right? Now, fish is on the table. We can move past this and our team and our relationship, right? Gets even stronger from being able to hold each other accountable, right? So that's the fourth piece. That's like the, the, the magic piece. Every day you have to have this opportunity, this safe place, come from a place of love, come from a place of understanding to put the fish on the table. Thanks, Tommy. That's awesome. S sorry to point you out, Matt. Didn't mean to call you out. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, Lily's wondering, uh, you you touched a little bit about this, but I'd, I'd like to dive into this a little bit more if you're okay with it. Uh, Lily's wondering if you could uh, chat a little bit about how you deal with personal bias in real estate agents and in other clients and how you've been able to overcome that over the years. That's a great, that's a great question. You know, here's the thing, you know, it, it's part of it for me is understanding, knowing we all have bias, right? Like I, I even have bias, you know, as a person of color here. So it's understanding that uh, and accepting that um, and knowing that you don't need to tolerate that, right? And knowing scenarios where I'm okay, right? My integrity is most important. So there's been times where I've had clients, you know, say things that I don't agree with and I don't tolerate and I've put it out there just saying, hey, you know, putting the fish on the table, right? Respectfully, you know, I don't agree with the statement you said or the views. And I don't know that this is going to be a right fit for me to work with you, right? And I've fired clients. I've walked away from scenarios because at the end of the day, right, I need to look at myself in the mirror and feel proud of who I am, right? When I cash out. So part of it is that. The other part of it, right, is um, having the opportunity to proactively seek out education, right? We have to be able to want to learn and understand more, right? I'll give you an example. Last week, I was in Washington, D.C. for uh, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, their housing and wealth buildings conference, right? They go over a lot of housing stats and also housing issues that the Latino um, community goes uh, has to deal with hurdles and struggles uh, in the United States. Now, people will, will be like, hey, why were you there? Uh, you're a Korean guy. Do you service a lot of Latino uh, clients? No, the majority of my clients are not Latino. However, right, my, my goal, our goal as realtors is being that conduit, that bridge to the American dream, um, you know, here in the U.S. at least of home ownership uh, for our clients. I only understand and have one perspective of what that means personally for me and my family's journey. It's important for all of us to be the best version and the best realtor that we can for our clients and consumers to proactively seek and understand what that means for other groups, right? What does that mean? What are the struggles involved and associated for our, our Latino and Latina brothers and sisters, right? What does that mean for our Black, African-American brothers and sisters, right? Asian uh, realtors, LGBTQ plus um, home buyers, right? So it's proactively seeking, meeting people where they are to understand and seek out those edu uh, education struggles so that you, right, when those biases come up, can be more educated and know how to uh, handle those situations and really how to protect this industry so that we can get closer to having an even level playing field, right? So proactively seeking that out and, and staying true to who you are and your integrity, 
um, having that mindset of abundance because it's okay to walk away from certain clients because there's going to be more opportunity that comes from that. So we've got a ton of people in the room right now. Uh, and someone asked us, I think, really early in, what advice would you give to a new agent? And and if we and I want you to kind of maybe expand on that because you've talked a lot about um, not just things to do, but kind of I think uh, more wholesome ideas on on how to you know treat your business and how to treat your clients. And and, and but if like if you were to talk to a new agent, right, someone that's like a month in, what would you tell them? So I will tell. Okay, I'll I'll do some uh granular stuff and then i'll do some like overarching like mindset stuff right one granular stuff start tracking everything okay start tracking every phone call how many phone calls you make how many face to faces you make where relationships and referrals came from who that referral source was right because at the end of the day the more you track from day 1 you're basically being able to write out a recipe of how at the end of the year you created this final dish that you saw, right? What I mean by that, I'll give you an example. My lead buyer specialist, uh, Krista, you know, one year, right? We look back at her annual review and she realized that uh, almost 40% of her business that year came from sitting open houses, Okay. Had she not tracked that, she would have not known that. And that's such an easy one. But she even tracked how many open houses she did the entire year, how many hours spent, the activities she did, the follow-up. Because she did that, you can reverse engineer. And she knew like, okay, cool. If I want to double that, I see the recipe, right? I just need to host X amount more, double those open houses, double the follow-up. And theoretically on paper, Based on my results, I should be able to double my open house volume, right? If you see that you're getting a ton of, like for me personally, one year tracking all this, I realized that I had a lot of business coming from financial advisors. So I said, you know what? I'm going to double down on the financial advisors. What does that mean? It's not just seeking out more, but putting more attention, making more deposits into the financial advisors we work with. And guess what? We saw more opportunities come from there, right? So you can't do that unless you start tracking that data. And if you're watching this saying like, oh my gosh, my stomach just dropped. I've never tracked a thing in my life. You can start today, right? It's super important to do all this stuff. Even when it comes to in the process, right? We track how many showings we get on a listing before we get an offer, right? So we know that after eight showings, our Weinberg Choi listing should get one offer received. Why, why is that important to understand that, right? Well, one, it's great on the front end when I'm meeting with sellers, right, at listing appointments to be able to share our process and tell them ahead of time, right, these are the metrics I'm looking at. And if we're not seeing things and we know when we need to shift, but in the process, when now I have to bring that back up and I can tell them like, hey, we've had 20 showings, seller. We should have had at least two offers come from that. We didn't, right? Based on the feedback, people are not agreeing with the value that we're saying your property is worth. So now it's time to make that adjustment, right? Or, hey, we've only had one showing, right? We should have one offer after eight showings, but we're not even near that eight showings. The public is not agreeing with what they see on their mobile device. When you have those data points from you tracking, you can't refute that. I've had people, trust me, I've had people try and refute it, but I go back, right, to the logic on that. And then they agree and say, you're right. Okay, cool. Let's let's improve our price to whatever we need to, right? You can continually move on your business, but it all starts with knowing your data tracking your data. So do that. Two, you need to build your database, right? And it doesn't matter what kind of tool, CRM you use, blah, blah, blah. When you're first starting out, that's the number one question I always get from new agents. Like, hey, what uh, what CRM do you use? That's like if you have an opportunity to sit down with the Michelin star chef, the number one James Beard award-winning chef in the world, 
right? To learn from them. And you start asking, what kind of pans do you use? What kind of knife do you use? No, you want to understand how their palate works, how they formulate these recipes, right? It doesn't matter what kind of tools or whatnot. Not until you're at doing this at a high level where you can now pick different tools that will give you more efficiencies to do things quicker and cheaper, right? But when you're first starting out, Excel spreadsheet, Google's, you know, uh, spreadsheets, that's fine. What you need to have is people's first name, last name, their address, their email address, their cell phone number, right? And their birthday. Just get those things. And if you take time day one to just call every single person in your world to just collect that data, right? You're going to have opportunity. The third tactical thing, going back to the face-to-faces we discussed, right? I made it a goal like... I don't know, 12 years ago that I wanted to meet one new person a day. Okay. So 365 new people every single day. I've been doing that for 10, 12 years now, right? If you, everyone gets hung up on like trying to find leads, this and this and whatnot. If you make it a goal to just have 10 face-to-faces from Monday to Friday. Okay. And I'll break down how to do this. 10 face-to-faces, whether these people want to buy or sell today or not, and you're able to continually put people into your database and continually market to them, you're going to have opportunity come from that. Just focus on meeting people, right? Follow the Ford model, figure out ways to make deposits, identify first if they're a jerk or not, right? How do you do 10 face-to-faces? Sounds aggressive, right? It's simple, right? For me, I have to eat lunch every day. Not just to nourish my body, but I'm like, I get hangry. I'm the worst person to hang out with if I'm, I'm, I get, I'm, hang, I'm hungry. So I have to do this. That is uh, an activity I choose not to do by myself, right? I will go and have, I'll break bread with someone every single day. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm paying for their lunch, right? Now, the people I meet with, sure, that might be a small deposit I make and I'll do. But when I was first starting out, just go to a point and service restaurant, right? Go somewhere where you step up to a counter, you order, you pay, you step aside, let them order, pay, and then you sit down. It's the act of breaking bread together, right? And guess what? Everyone has to eat lunch. And lunch is a 45 minute an hour thing, right? So people know I got to eat anyways. Sure, I'll eat with you. It's not going to like be a three hour commitment. I got I have a, I have a way out of this if it's not going good. Cause I got to go back to work, right? Break bread with someone for me, three o'clock, right? Because I said, I, you know, I don't work out. So my body doesn't produce endorphins naturally. So I have to manufacture them through caffeine. So three o'clock is when I hit that wall and I need a cup of coffee. When I have coffee, I don't do that activity by myself. I have a face-to-face and I invite someone to have coffee with. Now people come to me in my office to do it, right? But when I first started and I didn't have this, uh, you know, influencer status where people are like, no, no, you got to go to him. Like, trust me, like he's going to make cool deposits. I would just set up shop at a local coffee shop, okay? Always show up Monday through Friday at three o'clock, right? And it's important that it's a mom and pop shop because that store owner will always see you right? And always recognize you. And they'll remember what you're doing. And they'll honor that and show their gratitude. And because then when, you know, Marissa comes and meet me for coffee there, I'm already there with my coffee, you know, because I'm there early, you know, I don't even have to pay for the person's coffee because Marissa comes in. And it's like, Oh, my gosh, sorry, I'm late. Um, you know, and I'll be like, do you need anything? It's like, you know what, let me go up, I'll get my own coffee or whatnot goes up Matt's it's his coffee shop, right? And he knows like, oh, are you meeting with TC? And she's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect, right? Now they're going to roll out the red carpet for you. They're going to do an extra flower design on top of your latte with the steamed milk, right? They're going to make you feel really special. And you come down like, man, like they really love you here. Like I'm here every day, right? Figure out that one home court advantage spot, have people come meet you for coffee. You make a deposit into that shop owner. You make a deposit into this person, right? Do those three things, right? Start tracking your data, get your database set, do 10 face-to-faces, right? A week, I'm telling you, you're going to have opportunity come from that. Now, the overarching, 
like uh, mindset stuff. And Matt and I have discussed this before, right? One, we work in one of the most transparent agencies or uh, 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 industries out there, right? We all know how much volume someone sells. We can do the math backwards. We can figure out and look at how much GCI someone has. And it's easy to compare yourself to that person and be like, man, that person, you know, I think I'm better than them. How come, you know, they're so much more successful? You can't compare yourself to other people, right? At the moment you do that, the moment you're stuck while other people are, are passing you, right? You have to instead focus on your growth daily incremental growth, just be a little bit better than you were from the day before. And my two favorite words in, 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 in the English language, compounding interest, right? That's going to compound into bigger things daily. So just focus on being better than who you were from the day before, right? Two, this is the most important, right? You have to know that the direction you travel in is much more important than the speed doesn't matter how long or how fast it takes you to get to where you're going because when you're there you're there and you're in the moment you can celebrate it what's more important is to identify your north star what direction am i going in and just follow that right because eventually you're going to get to where you are and it's going to be a beautiful thing so remember the direction you travel in is much more important than the speed Focus on that daily incremental growth, being better than who you were from the day before, not better than someone else. And you're going to find yourself successful agent. And then you're going to be like, hey, I got to give back. I want to be a part of the YPN board. I want to give back in a higher level and leadership, right? And it's going to be this beautiful, sustainable cycle of success. Tommy, you are awesome. I Thank you. I could listen to you talk all day. The things that you say are very, very well aligned with the way that I know Matt and specifically I uh, do business and do life. So if I could listen to you talk all day, I totally would. Um, we are at the end of our hour, however, so we have to part ways. I am glad that I could meet your goal of meeting one new person a day. It has been out standing to meet you. Um, I already love you. I already follow you on Instagram. Um, I will just also shout out that if you, uh, this is being recorded, it will be posted to our YouTube channel and it will get emailed out once it's ready. I know there were a few people asking. Um, if you want to keep following along, we've got some more great webinars uh, coming up. Just give myself a follow or Matt a follow. Uh, if you've got any questions about the content, Matt or I are happy to answer. We're pretty, pretty easy to find on Instagram and Facebook. Um, thank you once again, Tommy. Thank you, Matt, for putting this together. This has been absolutely amazing. Um, have a super wonderful day, everybody. And if you can take one thing that Tommy said and action it, do it. You'll be better for it. Thank you for having me. See you all.